All right, good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. My name is David Groves. Um, I'm with the Rand Corporation, and I'm really pleased to be uh, the host of this session entitled COVID-19 Response and Recovery. Uh, this is the first of two sessions on this topic. The second session will be on Thursday um, in the morning. Um, I am going to, or I'd like to just present a couple of framing ideas and concepts around COVID-19 uh, and DMDU, and then I will move into introducing our uh, three amazing speakers, and then, of course, we'll move into uh, the presentations. Um, so let me dive right in. So, um, you know, for those of you who have been with the society for a while, or those who are just getting, uh, you know, getting familiar with it, um, you know, DMDU methods often focus on long-term problems and challenges. Um, you know, in past meetings, you know, the vast majority of uh, talks, et cetera, were around topics such as water resources planning and uh, climate change, adaptation, mitigation, coastal management, transportation, other infrastructure planning, and, and generally just, you know, policy questions that, that are that are around planning for the uncertain future, but in the long term. Um, however, you know, I think this isn't going to surprise anybody, but the progression of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is in fact deeply uncertain, even though it's upon us right now and we're making decisions right now that will have impacts tomorrow as well as in the next come in the coming months and and, and ultimately years. Um, I'm just uh, just on the left, I just show the latest uh, progression of the of the disease in terms of worldwide cases. This is from the New York Times from this morning. You can see here that we're you know we reached uh, you know record highs this past week or uh, the past few days. Um, you know, looking at a, almost uh, a little bit over a half a million new cases every day. Um, you know, as we've been tracking this progression over the past months, of course, there's been ups and downs and you know flare-ups in different parts of the world and, and understanding how that happens um, is something that we, we do have some sense for, but there are lots of uncertain factors that are driving that. Um, going forward, we have, you know, continued um, questions about how best to, you know, use non-pharmaceutical interventions and, and uh, including, you know, wearing masks. Um, and then we've also got the, uh, you know, potential vaccines on the horizon. Um, Eli Lilly, as many of you know, just released um, some preliminary findings that suggest that a vaccine is 90% effective. Well, that that's that's a quite a different number than some people were thinking just just the day before. And of course, does that actually play out in the in the long term? We don't really know. So this uh, you know leaves us with some questions about how can DMDU methods help COVID-19 response and recovery? And that's what this session's about. Um, I'd like to now introduce our speakers uh, briefly. I'll give a bio. Uh, for them before we uh, do each talk, um, but we have three talks um, listed here on the present um, on the slide. Um, Pedro uh, Nascimento de Lima will start off um, talking about seeking robust COVID nineteen response and ad adaptation strategies, and then we'll move into two other talks. So let me briefly introduce Pedro. Uh, he is a, an assistant policy researcher and a PhD candidate at the Party Rand Graduate School in Santa Monica. He has a BS and MS in production engineering from Brazil, and his primary interests are in um, you know, applying DMDU methods to various applications. And he has been working very, very hard this past uh, you know, nine months or eight months or however long, many months COVID has been on the scene, um, working with colleagues at RAND and elsewhere um, to model COVID-19, and he's going to um, share some of those, some of that work uh, now. So let me uh, hand things over to Pedro, and uh, please take it away. And you've got about 15 minutes, like I said, Pedro, and um, for, for your, uh, your piece. All right. So this talk is about seeking robust COVID-19 response and adaptation strategies. You see the list of co-authors. This is not an individual work. In fact, uh, I think I collaborated with over 10 people in this process in various projects. So cannot take uh, credit for this. Well, this presentation will go over a br brief introduction um, to the problem. Then we will dive into lessons that I think we, we learned about applying DMDU to these uh, questions. So just to introduce this problem, um, we think that pandemics pose a significant challenge for formal uh, decision-making process. And the, the problem is particularly hard because controlling COVID is really managing a partially observable nonlinear system 
without a stable equilibrium. And if you studied nonlinear systems before, you know that it, the system is in a place that is bound to uh, get out of control. And uh, controlling COVID is really managing the system even without being able to fully observe them. For instance, how many people are asymptomatic um, COVID-19 uh, uh, infected people in your neighborhood? No one has this information and yet we have to control COVID-19. Even when vaccines become available, and that's probably, it's very, very likely to happen in the next few months, deciding NPIs will be hard. It, it's, it's not going to make uh, deciding NPIs easier because different states will be positioned at different levels of immunity. And not many studies have actually played out what happens when you have NPIs, potentially adaptive NPIs, and you also have a vaccination program how you should change your NPIs in response to the vaccination program. So that's what this analysis is about. This analysis is based actually on our prior work. Back in May, we published this tool with static NPIs, by NPIs I mean non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so we built on this work. And in this tool and report, we have actually an epidemiological model that estimates cases, hospitalizations, deaths from COVID, and we have an economic model that gives us an estimate of the cost of different levels of non-pharmaceutical interventions, or what we call non-pharmaceutical intervention portfolios. And what the, these portfolios are levels of interventions, and our models are integrated in that we use the same set of baseline interventions in our epidemiological model and in our economic model so that we can have a meaningful conversation about trade-offs that these policies impose. And this is also based on an, an R package that does a lot of work actually to get data calibrated model. I won't go into this, but just so you know, there is some work behind what I'm presenting today. And then uh, based on that work, we now present an analysis that is based on the RDM framework where we iterated several times from the decision framing process, evaluating strategies and performing vulnerability analysis. And that's the three main steps that we will show here today. So to give some context and to provide some problem framing, imagine you are the governor of California and you have to decide how to manage NPI levels over the next year. And that's the decision that every local decision maker had to do and has to do over the next few months. And so the way that it's working in California is that the government is defining thresholds for reopening based on the number of cases observed. And in this particular framing, we are talking about California and the US. This is not a small island, so it's a continental country. And we assume that the government cannot eradicate COVID completely. The population decides to engage in social distancing and wearing masks to an uncertain degree. NPI comes at a price and in our particular analysis, this is computed by a general equilibrium model. And what's going to change in the future is that we will get a vaccine eventually. And we may or may not revise this policies conditional on a vaccine. So that's the basic elements of the problem framing we have. And you may ask, well, is this a realistic? So if you think this is not particularly realistic, I would invite you to look at the California reopening plan this structurally is structured uh, roughly in the same way. It's different because it's much more detailed. It goes to a very specific uh, level of detail, for instance, at what capacity should pet groomers open. And uh, our analysis is not as detailed as the California plan, but it does represent and, and tries to capture the same dynamic. So another thing that is required to really understand what's going on in our analysis and with these policies is to understand how NPIs work. And so you imagine you are a node in your household network, right? You're a person here in your household network and you're also a node at your work, right? And so at each network layer, you can think that you live in several networks at several layers. You have some chance of getting COVID from every person in this network. And the way that NPIs work is that we basically cut these networks either 
through, for instance, mask wearing or just shutting down businesses. And in our model, this network is not explicitly represented as it, they, they are in agent-based models, but we do model this heterogeneity by representing six mixing modes across 11 subpopulation groups with a deterministic ODE. There are other ways to accomplish the same goals, but that's the approach that we take and that's how we model this. And so how these policies work in our model and in the real world? Well, we, we have this transmission network and based on this transmission network, we see progression of the disease. So there is a disease progression model with number of people susceptible and so on and so forth. You transition from these states as you get COVID. And what we do with these policies is that we observe prevalence or incidence of COVID in the real world. And given a certain level of caution, we determine the NPI level. And by NPI level, we mean that if this NPI level is zero, it means that you don't change your transmission network. If it's really high, if it's six in our case, you shut down non-essential businesses and basically everything you can possibly do to for transmission. So that's the basic control loop that is in our model. And the outcomes we observe from this process are deaths and income loss computed by our general equilibrium model. Now, if you agree that that's what's happening, you probably will also agree that in the next few months, we will perturb this system, right? Things will change. And specifically, vaccine will probably change how the system operates. Mask wearing can make the system operate at a different level of transmission and also treatment improvements, all these things change the dynamics of the system. And so the question that we pose with our experimental design is, well, if you have an initial level of caution, first, what is the level of caution you should have until you get a vaccine? That's the first question. The second question is, well, what is the final level of caution you should have once you get a vaccine and you wait for the vaccine distribution? And the third question is, when do you transition from this initial level of caution to this final level of caution. That is to say, how do we manage our level of caution over time? So that these are the questions that we are posing here. And to simulate that, we set up an experimental design where we have these three decision levers, and we also have a couple of uncertainties, including mask wearing factor, the vaccination capacity, and vaccination efficacy. So as you manage the system, as you change the decision levers, we are also considering these uncertainties. Just to give you a sense of results and how the model dynamics look like, these are results we get from the model in the absence of a vaccine. And we are simulating the system at three different levels of caution, one, one high level of caution, one that is a, a small level of caution, and one that is average. What you can see is that if you have a really low level of caution, what happens if you, you see a big bump in the number of cases and in response you have to eventually shut down the economy, but that's generally too late to avoid this uh, increase in the number of deaths. And so only with a high level of caution, you can control COVID. So in, in all these scenarios, we are simulating a constant level of caution, meaning you're not changing being more cautious with time or less cautious with time. And now to look at the trade-offs we have in the system, we now take the final income loss that we observe and the final number of deaths we observe, and we plot each level of caution. And we see that with a high level of caution, you can achieve a low number of deaths, but at a certain income loss price. And as you relax, you, you see more deaths and less income loss. And now the question is, well, okay, we, we observe this trade-off over here. The question is, how do we push this curve inwards? And so one way, if you have a cheap way to reduce transmission, like wearing masks or social distancing, you actually save lives and you also help the economy. And so if you are a place with a small level of caution, as we have been observing in some places, you get a really expressive reduction in the number of deaths. If you're a place that is highly cautious, you get an improvement in the economy, not so much in the number of deaths because you're already being cautious with your NPIs. So just wearing masks really shifts this trade-off curve inwards. 
And this is also assuming that we, we don't get a vaccine. The question now is, well, a vaccine, as David uh, mentioned, is very likely to work and be distributed in the next few months. So what happens when we get a vaccine on January 1st? These are the model dynamics in the presence of a vaccine at different levels of mask wearing. So if you are in a place where you're not wearing masks, we are using a level of caution of one, so you're moderately cautious. What happens is that you see an increase in deaths before the vaccine arrives, which might be a scenario that we are heading to because the levels of cautions in the United States are not that high. We're seeing increases in deaths. And in the opposite side, if you wear masks and you have a high level of mask wearing in the society, what you see is that you are able to hold infections sufficiently and the vaccine actually has a higher contribution to reducing deaths in the long run. So this result is not surprising, but it illustrates that really waiting for the vaccine is as important as getting the vaccine. These results that I just showed you are holding our level of caution constant. And the next question that people will ask as soon as we get a vaccine is, well, can we stop doing social distancing? Can we stop wearing masks? Can we stop, uh, can we have large gatherings again? And th this question will be really relevant. And so what we do now is that once we get a vaccine, we wait for three months in this particular scenarios that we are looking at, and then we reduce our level of caution. So this is this trajectory that we're seeing here. So what happens is that you have a high level of mask wearing, and then after three months, you relax your level of caution, meaning you reopen to a higher degree. And that's the transition with masks, with a high level of mask wearing, and that's the transition that we can expect without mask wearing. So mask wearing, again, is really important for us to be able to transition to a post-vaccine uh, um, role and reduce levels of cautions. Otherwise, we get really bad outcomes. Now, I could go over this for hours with you and explore and walk through these scenarios. Now, let's just look at the big picture and see what happens when we are changing uncertainties and, and decision levers at the same time. And so we now show the full set of scenarios we run, and they are positioned in this income loss, that's a trade-off curve, and we are magnifying the boundary cases, that is the best cases and the worst cases. And then we just ask what a mask wearing, for instance, does. And what we can see from this picture is really that you only are able to access this better position in this graph if you have a high level of mask wearing. So there is no way to get here without high levels of mask wearing. If you don't have high levels of mask wearing, you are most certainly heading this direction. And another thing we can also look at is, well, what about the transition dates? Should we wait a few months after we get a vaccine to relax NPIs, or can we do that instantaneously? And the answer is, we have to wait. We can't simply get a vaccine and reduce our levels of caution. We have to wait a couple months for the vaccine distribution, actually, until we reduce our level of caution, and we have to transition to this new level of caution. This is a closer look at this surface. Another step that we did in this analysis was to run classification algorithm to get the general lesson and the big picture ideas. And the results that we find, I will not read the card um, tree for you, but the, the result we get is not surprising. We need a combination of mask wearing late transition date and stringent policies to achieve the best scenarios. And we don't achieve the same kinds of results without a vaccine. That means no strategy can compensate for the lack of a vaccine in these particular runs. All right, so what are the key takeaways? Well, as I said, we see that anything you can do to stop transmission at a low price makes the economy better off and saves lives. Transitioning to a new level of NPIs after vaccine is possible, but needs to be done cautiously. It cannot be too soon. And we have to achieve higher levels of immunity in the population to do that. And we have to do that to reduce the income losses we are seeing. 
there are lots of interactions among vaccination and NPI policies. So this is really important to be overlooked. Um, and so really the best strategy would be a full orchestrated containment strategy. And all the strategies that we're simulating are really under the assumption that the United States as a country is not controlling COVID, which unfortunately is the truth. Now, there is a long list of limitations of, of this analysis. We don't consider multiple vaccines. We don't model alternative vaccination strategies, and so on and so forth. And there are some lessons that I think we, we, we learn about applying this DMDU in this, in this context, right? So this is a really fast-moving uh, problem, and it, the problem can move faster than model development, and that happened. And so at some point, we decided that we would think about what would be the next questions that will be relevant. So that's why we decided to go into the vaccine strategies and that turned out to be fairly timely. Also, model-based analysis can be helpful. It is really helpful, but really following the best performer policies can be more practical. And by that, I mean, follow what successful countries are doing and uh, the models would just repeat the same message. Okay, I think these are the main takeaways. So now, um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions or um, we go to the next. Yeah. Pedro, thank you so much. That was a really, really informative presentation and a great kickoff to the session. I think I would like to go to the next speaker since we've gone a little bit over into, uh, into the discussion time, but we can pick up any questions at the end once we make sure we've heard all the presentations. So let me just uh, briefly introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Helgeson is a research economist at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. She works on resilience to complex hazards, among a variety of other um, issues, and she's currently a member of the National Construction Safety Team. So with that, I'd like to ask you, Jennifer, to share your screen, and um, we look forward to your talk. Wonderful. All right. Thanks for having me today. Um, so a little bit of a, a shift, um, sort of... Um, sort of uh, more meso in scale, but thinking at the, the individual entity level, I'll be talking more about complex event resilience of small and medium-sized enterprises, so mostly businesses. Um, and really, where I come from is, is thinking a lot about natural disasters. And for better or for worse, there have been quite a few during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So this is um, some very basic reporting on kind of the first wave of a multi-wave um, survey of, of small and medium-sized businesses. Okay, so the objectives that we're looking at um, really want to understand if there's resilience-based mitigation actions that have been employed during COVID-19 um, to assess the challenges in implementing these actions. Um, and, and what we're getting at is the idea that a lot of businesses now do have plans, especially towards cybersecurity, natural disasters, as, as there's more frequent natural disasters, more acute and more chronic type extreme weather. A lot of businesses really do have very robust plans, even smaller ones. Um, so we want to see if these past strategies and any of those approaches um, have been adaptable during the current situation that businesses are facing. Go ahead and assess sort of planned resilience actions. So this idea of the plan um, and intended behavior, and as COVID-19 goes on and we phase back, um, actually the actualized behavior of what people are saying in wave one, you know, holds up in maybe wave three of, of such a survey. And again, um, just, you know, there's been a lot said about minority owned SMEs, micro businesses where there's less than 10 employees, they tend to be very different um, in nature, those that are deemed essential versus non-essential by the US government. So and we're keeping an eye out for those elements they are not the main um, focus areas. So. so why is this really important? Um, a few statistics, you know, SMEs make up a great deal of economic activities. Um, the thing to note is there's a lot of SMEs that come into business. There's a large turnover anyway. And I think that is something to be very upfront about in this type of research. Um, 
that they generate a lot of jobs, but kind of that tends to be on a rolling basis, even in the best of times. Um, so COVID-19 has clearly impacted these SMEs through safety measures, limiting customer interactions, reduced employee availability, and um, at least at the start, just major supply chain issues. Um, these are some, some of the earlier predictions, um, it, you know, it, really about 30 million of the most vulnerable jobs during this time are, are at an SME. And I think one thing to, to note um, is that these SMEs that are in areas that are vulnerable to extreme weather have just had really added concerns as they sort of prepare for recovery and, and future resilience. And they're, you know, well-known liability of smallness, liability of newness. In some sectors, this could be an um, generally a liability. Okay, so a lot has been written. Um, I have a citation here, of a fairly well-known article from, from 2019, what are cascading disasters, right? So a lot has been written about this idea of compound risk, interacting risk, interconnected, cascading impacts. And where we're coming at this is this idea that, you know, there's a multi-risk environment and there might be slow and more rapid onset disasters or persistent stressors, um, economic shocks that sort of require taking this whole systems approach to thinking about the complex events that arise from these either compound or cascading risks. So, you know, compound also covers concurrent risk. Um, so here's, um, you know, just, just demonstrating there's a lot of hazards that have occurred. A lot more will, will happen in the next 12 to, to 18 months. Um, okay, so typically, you know, businesses and other entities within a community, you know, as they're going through this process of recovery, you know, there is an adaptation and learning. And hopefully you kind of, over time, build greater resilience. So what we have done, um, and this work really came out of the disruption of, of other work that had been ongoing, kind of more place-based studies. Um, and we were gearing up after an initial pilot and then COVID came. So we've done this online survey of, of small, medium-sized businesses to look at COVID-19 impacts, coping mechanisms, which we differentiate from from adaptation that is, um, let's say, allows for long-term continued growth, recovery expectations, then kind of what the business has done related to natural hazard mitigation and our adaptation in the past, um, attitudes and expectations, and then you know, basic business information. Um, we're just now on the cusp of, of starting our wave two. I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but following up as there's been restrictions lifted, but also there's expectations and uncertainty around flu season. Um, you know, now there's been some vaccine news that's positive, but I think you know, this ties in a little bit to our last talk. Will that actually kind of give a signal that that makes people think um, uh, we, we should be a little more free or you know, are they are they nervous about people kind of becoming a little bit more open in their actions and, and kind of going back into even a deeper wave or second wave of COVID? And you plan a third wave and then um, thinking about over time as continued natural disasters occur during the pandemic, but also you know into the future, what what was learned and and how that affects. Um, what we've done. So we disseminated this online survey to counties around the US um, with natural disaster experience. And you know, we sampled at random with a little bit of extra emphasis on certain industries. Um, we'll also have a refreshment sample kind of in line with the, the second wave of the data. Um, but we really targeted businesses of about 100 employees or fewer at a single site. Um, I'm happy to talk more about why we do that. SBA's um, thought of, of what a small and medium-sized business is can be very tricky depending on sector. Okay, so 
some preliminary results. We have, we have three pieces written up if people are keenly interested to understand um, you know, the methods and, and kind of the initial findings. But um, here's our respondents by census region. Um, you know, I should mention that I'm a little bit constrained um, by, by being able to present things that have uh, been approved by Department of Commerce and have already been published. So you know, again, happy to, to kind of follow up and to discuss more over time. So this is the percent of respondents affected by natural hazards in the past relative to that specific region. Not surprising because we weren't um, completely representative in the, the initial sample. So actions to address natural hazards or disasters in the past have actually helped address COVID-19 impacts. Um, largely, yes. For both those entities that have said they have experience with natural disasters, not just planning. Um, so largely, yes, across the board, even those that are kind of a little bit unsure. And, and which actions? And I think what is, is interesting is we continue to, to work in this space and it's not completely unexpected, but just given the trends across the US, most businesses, especially the small ones, don't have you know, pandemic specific plans. So what we think about a lot at NIST is things like disaster agnostic plans. Is there something that can be done um, that sort of relate to many types of disasters, whether those be different natural hazards or cybersecurity or pandemics. So some of the issues and opportunities um, arising from COVID-19, there were some, some very positive things that, that people mentioned. Um, in some ways, minimal customer interaction is perceived as allowing for, for maximum flexibility, um, depending on sectors, kind of, if you're successful marketing online, you know some six sectors are, do this more easily than others or were set up more easily, this can be really great. Um, I think from the employee side, especially those that still had to, to be there in person, there's some major um, concerns with increased sort of leave requests, reduced productivity overall. And supply chains um, for manufacturers that, that we were able to survey Kind of this idea of split production shifts and the idea that there really um, was some capability to not have to see an end user gave them a little bit more flexibility, assuming availability of things like, like PPE. So of those SMEs, and I should say the total sample was 1,354 usable responses. Um, I think I did not mention that previously. Here, you know, in each, in many of the questions, we don't have the, the full sample, um, the response here were just over a thousand responses. But of those that had been affected by a natural disaster during COVID-19, um, so since March 13th, um, whether their response was affected by COVID-19 or not, um, if we, we show that here. Um, and of course, I think the, the, the big thing is kind of those percent of respondents actually expressing concern about these complex events arising from natural disasters during COVID-19 going forward. Um, not incredibly high numbers, but I think high enough um, that there is concern that SMEs that are already kind of disadvantaged um, financially or otherwise, resource-wise, um, do, do need to, to take some steps. So I will quickly, I know we're kind of under the gun for, for time. The big themes that came out of express needs, um, assistance navigating deep uncertainty. You know, how do you make meaningful decisions, um, especially when a business doesn't have much of a safety net? You know, not knowing a time frame for anything like a vaccine or how the market will react in the meantime. It's a major concern. Um, kind of clear detailed information and training, assistance with PP and other equipment, um, even as these things have become more readily accessible, uh, many of, of the smaller businesses are still really struggling um, either to obtain it or 
to um, to kind of follow the the local trends of what is required and, and what is not, and then access to financial assistance and financial information. And surprisingly, um, a lot of people do have things like business interruption insurance. There are very disappointing you know, COVID nineteen interruptions were not covered largely. Um, and of course, as, as the government kind of makes more decisions about financial assistance moving forward, this is something that was you know, very much highlighted by, um, by those respondents. So our wave two is in development, um, you know, a number of, of research strands, and, and I think this will be um, more interesting to kind of this space of, of deep uncertainty um, and, and kind of thinking about decision making as, as we move forward in these waves. Um, but really, you know, concern across complex event types and then kind of the confidence in, in SME recovery or not, and what that might mean for communities um, in a larger sense. All right, so I am um, happy to answer questions at the uh, appropriate time, according to our moderator. So if anybody has a question, you can either put in the chat or you can speak up since no one else is speaking right now. Rob? I have a question, Dave. This is Rob. Great. Hi, Rob. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. It's really interesting. I, it, it, are there any special information um, uh, provision, you know, sort of opportunities, requirements for the federal government in, in helping these small businesses deal with these multiple risks that say even are different than dealing with them one at a time? So any um, information that the government would provide? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, I mean, I do a lot of climate work, so I'm saying sort sure, of like sure. climate services. Yeah, so is, yeah. There, is there like so an this analogy? Is, um, I'll, I'll be very, you know, and, and I think depending on the audience, I present this a little bit differently and I failed to mention, you know, we're a standard making body um, where, you know, part of the US government were policy informing that policy making it NIST. And this is really responding to a request by, by SBA and other federal partners that are more closely tied to the individual SMEs. Um, this is something to the best of my knowledge uh, where, where there's nothing. Uh, it really, really formally provided, um, definitely not formally provided. And this is not a space where a lot of thought has gone in because typically we're used to these shocks, we can follow kind of the general FEMA, you know, model of, of recovery. Um, you know, there, there are persistent stressors, but things like heat, some of the things we think of more classically as persistent stressors um, for the environment side, you know, are, are, um, are important, but not so acutely felt at the individual level. So I think that the answer is, this is exciting. Um, you know, I wish there was a lot more to talk about. We, we had hoped that there'd be kind of more approved at this at this point for outside consumption. But I, um, it, it is a very new space and I'd be happy to, to kind of exchange some notes and, and think about it a little bit more with anyone interested because um, mm -hmm. there's just not much guidance, but there's also just classically not been a lot of thought about this because there are complex events constantly. Um, uh, but but especially in the business space, um, you know, typically kind of businesses after a natural disaster, you know, there's SBA loans. They tend to be quite mm -hmm. high interest. It's it's not the same as kind of uh, the homeowners after an event, right? Businesses typically are are kind of floating out there on on their own for the most part in terms of recovery. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that gets a, a little bit to the yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, I think I'll, um, we we'll should move on to Edmundo's talk and uh, maybe we'll have a minute or two at the end of his talk to uh, circle back to some of your topics. Um, so uh, let's see, let me share my screen here. So uh, Dr. Molina Perez is a assistant researcher professor at Tech de Monterrey, and he leads the decision-making center for uh, the School of Government and Public Transformation and has done a lot of work in Costa Rica, Argentina, and Chile. Um, and with that, I think I'll just let him dive into the talk. I should also mention that he is one of the key organizers of this entire event, and for that, we are um, very grateful. So thank you very much, Edmundo, and please uh, take over and um, look forward to your talk. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, let's start. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining to this um, session. I'll discuss to you some of the work we are doing at the uh, School of Government at Tecnico Monterrey, analyzing uh, different responses to COVID-19 uh, under uncertainty. This is uh, the work of myself, colleagues Fernando Gomez, Roberto Ponce, Luis Serra, Victor Espinosa. Special thanks to uh, Robert Lampert for um, giving us uh, insights uh, during the summer and in various um, uh, meetings we had um, was really um, useful. Rob, thank you. All right, so, um, you know, COVID-19 is obviously a huge crisis uh, right now. Um, it's a very important economic and humanitarian uh, crisis. I think for the society, what makes it also interesting is that it is, um, I think, the landmark of what is a deeply uncertain phenomenon. Uh, back in March and February, when the outbreak began, we, re we really didn't know what was, um, how deadly the, the virus was, while, which were the mechanisms for transmissions, and we uh, didn't know either um, how effective different response measures were. And, um, and this is a rapid, fast-paced event. So all this makes it a very interesting case study for the um, society as well, because it's not only uncertain, but it's just very rapidly evolving. To this crisis, as you can imagine, different countries have responded differently. What you see here is an um, axis that presents an um, index known as the stringency index. In the vertical axis, higher values of the stringency index means more effort for containment across uh, various different sectors, including uh, schools closing, um, social distancing, and other measures for um, uh, containment of the virus. And what you see on the horizontal axis is how many days have passed since um, a given country reached 100 confirmed cases? What you can see in this graph basically is that you know, countries have responded differently. Some of them have responded more vigorously to the pandemic. Some of them have waited a little bit more to see what happens. In the case of Mexico, what you can see is that we are among the countries that waited a little bit more to actually enforce um, a strict action. And not only that, the only challenge, the other challenge in Mexico is that we have all these uncertainties with the virus and we have done very limited testing, as you can see in this graph. The, ver the vertical axis is a daily test per thousand people. And then you can really see basically how Mexico has done very little testing and testing by itself is not gonna solve the problem, but testing is really something that helps you um, shorten the delays with respect to responding. And this is really what you see in this graph. Uh, what you're seeing here is, you know, the fusion curve for, for a, you know, hypothetical take, case for the virus. You're seeing the number of confirmed cases in the vertical axis. And then you're seeing on the horizontal axis, the number of these have passed since the first case has been confirmed. And then um, the different color lines reflect how much testing are you doing. And what you can see here clearly is that depending on how much testing you are doing, that is the amount of days that it takes you to really know and figure out how quickly the pandemic is progressing in your country. The combination of limited testing, a lack of coordination um, in uh, policy response has complicated containment efforts in Mexico. And this is what I want to highlight here in this graph. To the left, you can see what is the fatality rate of Mexico, uh, the prevailing fatality rate. And you see that that is sitting around 10%. It's a very high fatality rate, really among the highest in the world. And to the right, you're seeing um, basically what is the curve of number of confirmed cases in Mexico versus different estimates of the real number of confirmed cases. And really the takeaway uh, from this graph to the right is basically that since we have done some very little testing, we don't really know what's going on. And, um, you know, basically the pandemic has been able to move freely throughout the country. So what we've done at the School of Government, we have centered on three things. First, estimating reproduction rates based on estimated real number of cases. So one of the first things we did was developing a model that could help stakeholders understand what was the reproduction rate, not based on the confirmed number of cases, but on the potential real number of cases, and then advising governments over um, risk of reopening, as well as estimating economic impact of COVID. And now I will discuss briefly what we've done in these different areas. So we develop an epidemiological model. Um, and it's uh, you know based on a classic uh, tier model, which tracks different uh, populations in, um, of course, acceptable, the infected population, recovered, hospitalized, hospitalized population, and of course, the diseased population. The model is explicitly built to acknowledge that there's a difference between the number of confirmed cases and the actual real cases of COVID-19. And it was built uh, specifically for supporting exploratory modeling analysis. 
in addition to that, what we what we did was to really engage in a very substantial effort of calibration. We cal calibrated the model using simultaneously different data sources, including um, a confirmed number of cases, confirmed number of disease population, and daily dates of variation, controlling across states uh, using mobility data, number of tests, positivity, population size, and um, the government response reflected by the um, astringency index. And we did this calibration across the 32 states of Mexico. And this graphic basically just shows you um, the orange line is um, our calibration and the blue line is actually the historical record. What we really were careful about was not um, producing exaggeration with the simulation model. We were trying to be very conservative in that respect. That's why we used both records, confirmed cases and confirmed disease population. And what you can see is that the model um, is able to reflect realistically the historical record across the 32 states in Mexico. Now, I want to stop here a little bit because really the calibration exercise is a testament of just how uncertain this phenomenon is this phenomenon is and how futile predictions can be. So what you can see right now is this same exercise of calibration and uh, on the top row you see the number of confirmed cases, on the lower row you see the number of disease population. And what you're seeing on the orange lines are different, combi different combinations of parameters to calibrate the historical records. And uh, what you can see basically in this graph is that these three calibration runs reproduce very well what has happened but once you use those projections and project into the future in the short term, then you can really see just how, you know, the small differences in the calibration can just propagate and really produce very different results in the short term. And that really complicates um, analysis and advice because obviously you cannot um, rely on any of these um, predictions to actually uh, let governments and stakeholders know what to do for containment of the virus. So how we use exploratory modeling to analyze the stakeholder concerns? Well, uh, the first thing we wanted to help them understand was uh, how long it may take to stabilize reproduction rates across the country. The other area of concern that was very popular was really trying to understand how, which economic sectors might be more affected by the outbreak. And of course, um, two big concerns were um, understanding what is driving the growth in cases in the different regions and the level of vulnerability of different states. So using the calibrate baseline as a point of departure, we explore a wide range of possible trajectories. And this is what you're seeing here on the different columns, you're seeing different states of Mexico. And basically you're seeing there different scenarios for the diffusion of the virus across time. The solid line is that baseline cam calibration. And basically what we did was exploring around it. What, what, what happened if the calibration is slotted for some reason? What if those parameters are you know, uh, biased for some reason? So we, we, we really, um, explore um, widely across the uh, baseline trajectory to explore potential implications of the virus. So in terms of how difficult it was to contain the virus, what we did is uh, to produce estimates of what was the probability that at a given month in, in, in time, as you can see in the columns on this heat map, you will reach um, the famous R0 equal one um, milestone, which is, you know, the production radius has reached this milestone and you expect now that the virus will move um, at, a, at a lower speed. And what you can see uh, in this graph um, are two things. First is that if you see the rows, which are indications of the third two states of Mexico, you'll see that the country conditions are very heterogeneous and um, it, it, it's going to take different time for different states to actually be able to contain the virus simply because, you know, they, they have different populations and they were at different points in the diffusion of the virus. That's one thing. This is the second big takeaway is that you can see that it's not only until September when you could expect some uh, control over the diffusion of the virus. And it was very important because um, there was a lot of confusion in the summer in terms of how long or how easy it was going to be able to, what was going to contain the virus. And this experiment really showed that, I mean, this thing was here for the long term and required consistent action. For understanding economic impact, we cross-reference these um, diffusion curves with the census economic data of Mexico using the North American Industrial Classification System. So we really went into detail um, understanding which were the potential sectors that were going to be more affected across the country, across different states um, in terms of um, job, job loss. And for example, you can see here, uh, for instance, that this experiment allowed us to, uh, for example, uh, identify, you know, for example, the retail industry as one of the, you know, um, industries that will be most impacted by the virus. 
We work with various stakeholders to understand what were potential uh, risk of reopening the economy after reaching uh, RT equal one. And this is um, this heat map is just a summary of our experiment. And what you can see here again is uh, the rows for the different uh, states and columns are the number of days since you have reached R not equal to one. And, um, and the, the numbers and the color of the node, where is the probability that if you reopen after those number of days, you will have a spike in the number of cases. And then once more, you can see that the conditions in the country are very heterogeneous, that um, some countries, some, um, some states were closer to stabilization and had more safe um, conditions for reopening than others. And this, of course, was uh, useful to assess potential risk of reopening. In terms of drivers of new cases, we did the uh, analysis with the experiment and we found that mobility rates in Mexico were actually very well associated with the growth of uh, cases. This is what you see on the graphic on the left. You can see, for example, um, here is, we use a proxy for the mobility index using uh, Google data on mobility. And what you see is that mobility patterns are closely associated with you know, how quickly the reproduction rate of the virus is accelerating throughout the uh, country. Um, and to the, to the right, again, we analyzed for each country, basically given a position in time, how, how, how big was their budget in terms of allowing more mobility, which is something that you're seeing on the columns, basically, you know, with respect to the calibration conditions, if you have more or less mobility, what, what is the potential implications in terms of the reproduction rates for your different, different states? Um, yeah, yes, uh, you know, uh, as for concluding remarks, yes, containment, containment um, policies remain a challenge in Mexico. You can see this in some work we're doing for um, downscaling the stringency index at country level to um, state level using mobility data. And here really what I want to, um, you know, focus is you can see that all states responded basically uh, with more action when the outbreak happened. But uh, the variation of effort, it was just very high. And that's actually one of the reasons why uh, the outbreak has been so difficult to contain in Mexico. And just to conclude, going forward, we believe in Mexico is key to understand how to balance containment actions with other dimensions. We know now that there are general low-cost, high-impact measures, so, such as mass and testing. There are high-cost, high-impact, such as uh, contact tracing and treatment, and we should do as much of those as we can. But going forward, really the question is how we can open the economy in specific sectors without triggering uh, acceleration of the outbreak. And just to conclude, if you want to learn more about this work, we have a website set up for this, a GitHub repository, and a few, uh, a couple of blogs describing our work. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Edmundo. That was fantastic. We have a couple minutes for questions. Um, please either speak up or put a note in the chat window that you'd like to ask a question. All right, while people collect their questions, I have a quick question. Um, Edmundo, you, you showed at the beginning of uh, your talk a bunch of projections that, you know, based on, I think, you know, when you were doing the work, maybe in April or March or something like that. Um, you know, in terms of the actual trajectory of the way that the disease progressed through Mexico, through, you know, up to November, um, you know, where in that cloud of distribution of projections did, did you actually end up or did Mexico end up? Was it in that cloud or? That's a very interesting question. Um, the two answers. First, it was just very difficult. We had to update the calibration every week because mm -hmm. just, you know, seven days was enough to, you know, be outside the cloud of potential scenarios. Uh, for some cases, for example, in the summer for Mexico City was on the very positive scenarios, according to our, um, you know, our estimation. For some uh, states, uh, for example, sadly for the state of Nuevo Leon, uh, we had a huge acceleration during the summer. But yeah, I, I mean, it, this work had to be done every week uh, and actually took a lot of computational effort just to calibrate this using um, bootstrapping for the 33 countries, 32 um, states. Okay, great, thank you. Anyone else with a question or, or someone, uh, if anyone has follow up for Pedro's talk or, or Jennifer's, that would be fine too. We just have a two minutes, so I don't wanna start off on a whole new discussion, but maybe there's some few lingering questions. Uh, okay, there's a question for Pedro. Um, can you please explain, remind what the caution is and why it's okay to keep it static? So back to this figure, um, this, this level of caution is a number and it's a parameter in our model. And what it means is it's a multiplier of the prevalence. So if you have a 1% prevalence and you have a level of caution of zero, it means that you won't do nothing and you won't shut down anything and just allow cases to continue to grow. If you have a really high level of caution, say eight, 
it will go directly to the lockdown level in our model. So this number controls how cautious you are. From our, um, from what we've seen in some states, uh, level of caution in the US is roughly, roughly one from uh, an analysis we did a, a couple of months ago. But this number is just a way to represent how cautious a state is. And what we're saying is that depending on how you manage this number, even if it's implicit, this basically determines the long-term outcomes. So I think the question was, uh, can, is it okay? Why, why is it okay to keep it static? If you keep it static, it is not, um, it's what, what happens is that the cases will decrease as the vaccine arrives and you still will be shutting down the economy after you, um, you have a vaccine. What we did in our simulation was to experiment with having the vaccine, waiting a few months, then reducing the level of caution. And that is possible. And that uh, leads to a less income loss. Um, but you cannot do that before you distribute the vaccine. So that's the tricky part. So we have to be patient and wait for the vaccine wearing masks. If we instead go into the vaccine with a low level of caution, then the vaccine would not be that helpful because, well, people will get COVID before they get vaccinated. So that's the, the key message. Thank you, Pedro. We have a couple more questions, but it is the end of the session. So what I want to do is just um, briefly mention that we have a second, um, a second uh, set of talks on Thursday at 1015 Central. So we hope uh, you all can join. Um, in the meantime, we can keep this line open, I, I'm sure, for a few more minutes. And Pedro, you have a question in the chat, which I won't read, but if you can um, pull it up and, and address it, um, whoever wants to stay can uh, stay for that question and, and, and any, any more that we might have. And thank you so much for the speakers and all of your uh, attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so. Do you see um, the chat? Yeah, I see many questions. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, at the, it's at the end. Uh, <laughs> I think. Da -da -da. I looked at it last. Okay, how do you check your data on behaviors? For instance, what, what if the community mostly shuts down, but there are many <laughs> char rehearsals? Do you see that? Yeah, so that's um, that's an interesting question because here we are basically assuming that uh, all age groups have the same uh, level of mask wearing. In reality, that's not necessarily the case. You can have a couple of groups without the appropriate protections. So that's a challenge to manage. Um, our analysis doesn't address that, but that that is a problem that that should be in practice addressed and. I think the, the New York approach is really shutting down um, low levels of, of geographies, right? So instead of shutting down the state or a county, you shut down specific blocks. So that's a way to address that. Um, but that's, that's a challenge either way. Um, I think there's a question from George. There is, if in three months, so it's about the, the vaccine. Yeah, so in our model, the vaccine starts distribu is distributed uh, evenly over the year instead of in a big uh, uh, chunk of, of vaccines. So what we mean is that you have to wait for the vaccine distribution. If you vaccinate everyone in three months, that would be great. Of course, you can reopen without, uh, without a lot of problems if the vaccine is effective. If everyone gets vaccinated, but then immediately abandon, abandons all caution, isn't there some trouble because the vaccine doesn't take full effect immediately? That is a, a concern. And I think Raf is on the line. He can speak to that. Um, we think there is an endogenous behavioral feedback that if, if you get vaccinated, you might uh, choose not to wear a mask, for instance. That's a plausible hypothesis. And that is a concern. And um, and the, the, the worst hypothesis is that if people observe other people being vaccinated and they don't wear a mask because they think that now we have a vaccine so I can do whatever I want, that is a problem. And that has to be addressed um, uh, with consistent messaging. And, and, and ultimately, that's, the, that's an individual decision. So that is a, a tricky uh, problem. Right. Okay, I think I addressed the questions. If not, you can shoot me an email.
to other the other authors as well. Great. Anyone have anything? Any last remarks before we close the session? All right. Well, thank you all. We'll see you in other sessions, and particularly on Thursday for the continuation of this session. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.